to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said i came that they may have life and have it more abundantly john chapter 10 verse number 10. we welcome you to our study of the gospel of john john predicts or tells us about the life of jesus in a very graphic form that teaches us who Christ is, and how we should respond to the Lord and Savior. And so we encourage you to get your Bible, as we're going to be studying today, in John chapters 10 through 12. As you think about that, we also want to remind you that today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly on Sunday or Wednesday. They'd be happy to have a Bible study with you. Let them know if you'd like to study the Word of God together and look them up in your area. Also at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your Bible study. If you've got a question, you'd like to study God's Word further, you can call us or email us and we'd be happy to help you in that endeavor. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, they're being provided to you free of charge, whether on DVD that you can watch or a CD that you can listen to. We send those out free as well as downloads that are available from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Let's now turn our attention to our study at hand in John chapter 10 through 12. As we think about this segment, Jesus is going to be identified through several uh, pictures, word pictures, or characteristics of who Christ is. In chapter 10, He is the door that men must go through to be saved. Chapter 11, Jesus is the resurrection. I am the life and the resurrection, Jesus will say. And in John chapter 12, He is the ultimate judge of all men. As we begin with John 10 verse 7, Jesus says these words about Himself being the door people must go through to get to God. Notice John 10, verse number 7. The Scripture records, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. If I want to be a part of God's fold, if I want to be a, a child of God, a Christian, Friend, I must go through Jesus Christ. The door, naturally, is an entrance into something. You open the door and you go into the house. Jesus is that door men must go through to be a part of God's household. Remember John 14, verse 6? The Lord Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Again, John 10 verse 7 saying the exact same thing. Jesus said, I am the door that you've got to go through to be one of my sheep. And friend, we understand that's true as we think about the teaching of the New Testament to, to get into God's family, to get into Christ. I've got to go through Christ. Acts 4 verse 12, the Bible says, Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to get into Christ and be a part of God's family, then friend, I've got to obey God and do what He says and follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we see then Jesus as the door, but I also want you to see another image of Jesus found in John 10 verse 9, and that is Jesus not only gives us entrance into God's family, but He is the spiritual food or the spiritual sustenance we need to thrive in God's family. John 10 verse 9, Jesus would not only say, I'm the door, but Jesus would say that those who come in through the door, they'll find pasture or sustenance in me. 
the idea of sheep finding pasture, which of course be uh, pertinent, would be essential to their living. If they're going to find green pastures, you're going to have sheep that are well and healthy. Well, Jesus provides us spiritual pasture. He finds us spiritual uh, food. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 18 that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Do you remember the words of Jesus as he was tempted by Satan in Matthew chapter 4? Satan said, knowing Jesus was hungry, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Remember what Jesus said? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Matthew 5, verse number 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And thus, as we think about our Christian life, as we think about being part of God's fold, God's family, we need to grow and mature and, and feed on that spiritual food that God provides us in His Word. Here's a picture of that in the Bible. 1 Peter 2, verse 2 says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. You see, Peter was asked in John chapter 6, verse 66 through 67, when some of the disciples left Jesus and walked with Him no more, Jesus turned to the rest and said, Do you want to go away also? And Peter spoke up and said these ever-famous words, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I need to feed on the Word of God, grow spiritually, and really be a, what God wants me to be in His kingdom. Now friend, as we think about Jesus in John chapter 10, one thing that we clearly see in this text is that not only is Jesus the true shepherd, but He gives His followers the abundant or the best life. You want to have the best life? You want to be really happy, have joy, be really satisfied, find spiritual fulfillment, find peace and happiness? Jesus gives us that abundant life. Notice the words of John chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Ah, the abundant life, the best life, the, the life that is overflowing with God's riches and God's blessings. We think about that as a Christian and we're reminded how true that is. Do you remember the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3? The Bible says this, All spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing you can think about, from forgiveness to, to, to being part of God's family, to the blessing of prayer, to fellowship, whatever it may be, all spiritual blessings are ours. That's the abundant life that the Bible teaches us about. And friend, God wants you and He wants me to have that life. You see, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus gives me the strength the power and the ability, along with God's blessings, to have the abundant life. Who wouldn't want to live the abundant life? You think about it in a physical term. If we said, man, we can give you everything you'd ever want physically, wealth, happiness, power, fame, whatever it may be. Well, people would be lining up. The streets would be full of people wanting that life. Well, friend, God promises to His children the abundant spiritual life, help, blessings, beyond measure for the child of God. And then as we think about Jesus as the Good Shepherd, one of the things Jesus also identifies, being, being the Good Shepherd, Jesus also identifies that there are way too many people out there who are claiming to be Good Shepherds, but in reality, they're just hirelings. Now, you contrast this for just a moment. Before we even look at the verse, I want you to contrast this in your mind. Somebody who owns the sheep, somebody who owns cattle, cares for those cattle, those cattle are his livelihood, versus somebody who's just a hired hand. Is there any difference in those two? Well, yeah, one has a vested interest in it. The other one just shows up for a paycheck. And friend, there's a whole lot of difference in the way they react, how they feel toward them. The Bible teaches that Jesus being the true shepherd, He identifies that there are way too many hirelings who are just in it for what they can get out of it in the religious sense. Now here's the verse. Look in John chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. But a hireling 
He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. When hard times come, when danger comes, when things get difficult, the hireling tucks tail and runs. The shepherd, he stays there and fights and protects his own. Well, what's Jesus trying to talk, talk about here? In the religious world, there are a lot of hirelings. There are a lot of people who are in it for what they can get out of it. read a study a while back that said the quickest get-rich scheme in America is to start your own church. Now, friend, you think about all the people who are out there begging people for money, uh, appealing to their emotions. What are they really in it for? Well, friend, we want to be in it so that people can go to heaven so that people can know God, so that we, we're not in it for ourselves. We want to get out of the way and help people see Jesus and the cross and the hope of eternal salvation. And so that's the, that's the mindset of every Christian, to, to help people see Jesus and not just simply to make something, make a buck off of other people. And then we see this great statement in John 10. What a wonderful idea. Jesus is here seen. Probably the theme of John 10 Verse 14 and 15, Jesus is seen as the ultimate good shepherd. Notice these words. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. And the Father knows me. Even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. What makes Jesus the good shepherd? His love, His relationship with the Father, but just as much as anything else. His willingness to sacrifice. I laid down my life for the sheep. Now, the hireling, he's different. He sees danger. He sees the wolf coming. He tucks tail and runs. The shepherd, he stays there and fights, even to the point of giving his life for the sheep. Well, friend, you, you can clearly see what Jesus did in that scenario. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says, Jesus did do that. In fact, he tasted death for every man. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. And so when we think about Jesus as the Good Shepherd, we see just how much He gave up, just how much He sacrificed, and that you couldn't have somebody who cares for your soul more than Jesus does. Now, a wonderful statement is made toward the end of John chapter 10 that I want you to see for just a moment, and it has to do with the Scriptures. I want you to look at what Jesus, how Jesus felt and what He thought about the Word of God. Notice John 10 verse 35. The Scripture records Jesus speaking, If He called them gods to whom the Word of God came, now notice this parenthetical statement, and the Scripture cannot be broken. I understand that's just kind of a side point, parenthetical thought in the midst of the teaching of Jesus about God being the ultimate, only almighty God. But I want you to just see from the mindset of Jesus what He thought about the Word of God. And the Scripture cannot be broken. What's Jesus teaching us about the Word of God there? Well, Jesus teaches us several things, but first, He teaches its absolute truth. Friend, Jesus' view of the Bible was it was absolute truth. It could not be wrong. It could not be broken. It was not error. John 17, 17, Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus believed the Scripture was exact in its fulfillment. Every prophecy, every prediction, every verse and teaching that pointed to the Old New Testament Jesus believed in the fulfillment of Scripture. He believed it was inspired by God. Oh, Scripture, why can the Scripture not be broken? Because God's the author of it and God cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2, Hebrews 6 verse 18. And so when I think about Jesus' words here, it reminds me of the need to keep God's Word. If the Scripture cannot be broken, friend, it doesn't need to be broken in my life either. I need to make sure that I'm following the Scripture. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, It's not everybody that just looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then, friend, it reminds me of the complete 
nature of God's Word, meaning that the Bible has everything I need. Do you remember 2 Peter 1 verse 3? The Scripture says, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. When I think about the Scripture being everything we need, friend, how wonderful it is to know that God's given us that truth. Now, as we turn our attention next to John chapter 11, in this chapter, we're going to see the, the seventh and kind of the final climatic miracle or sign that Jesus performs. And, and this miracle, the raising of Lazarus, actually is going to show Jesus as the master of death. You remember the story? Lazarus died. He was, Jesus was close to this whole family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so uh, Lazarus' sisters, they request Jesus. And they actually say to him, Lord, if you'd, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, in essence, I'm going to bring him back. Now you remember Lazarus had been dead and buried for many days. In fact, they said he stinks by now. That's the graphic nature of what had already started to happen to Lazarus' body. And Jesus tells Mary and Martha, I'm going to bring him back. What do we learn from this miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Friend, we learn a couple of things that are very true. The first is one that we all have to face, and that is Sadly, all men everywhere are one day going to die. Like it or not, I'm going to leave this earth one day. Hebrews 9.27 assures me of that. It is appointed to man once to die, then the judgment. The Bible says in James 4 verse 14, What is your life? It's but a vapor here for a little while, then it vanishes away. At the best, 70, maybe 80 years is what I might have upon this earth. Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12. And so, death is a reality. All men everywhere are going to have to face. But here's the good news from the teaching in this chapter. For the faithful child of God, death is not a bad thing, and it is not the end. Jesus defeated death with the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57. This is why the psalmist said in the long ago, in Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. There's a, the good news is there's a day coming when all who are in the graves will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so, yes, death is a reality, but for the child of God, Death is not that evil, dark, dismal day that we're trying to do everything within our power to prevent. No, death for the child of God, from heaven's perspective, that's a blessing. Now, let's turn directly to, the atten to our attention, directly to uh, Jesus and the lesson He taught from the resurrection or the raising of Lazarus. Look in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. The Bible records these words at the resurrection of Lazarus. Martha said to Jesus in verse 24, I know he'll rise in the resurrection at the last day. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, Though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Jesus says. Friend, Jesus promises and Jesus gives resurrection and life to his followers. Now we're not talking about in the physical sense. Jesus is not going to help me to live forever in the physical sense. But spiritually he is. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, that one day... All who are in the grave will meet Him in the air and will always be with the Lord. Uh, all who are in the graves will one day come forth. Uh, John 5, verse 28 and 29. Our citizenship is in heaven, for which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body into His glorious body. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. And so when I think about what Jesus does, what it means to be a Christian, friend, this life is not my only hope. I have the hope of life after this, through the resurrection. Job asked a question, that man of suffering who faced so much difficulty and calamity asked a question that really isn't answered until John 11, 25 and 26. In Job 14, verse 14, Job asked, If a man dies, will he live again? And Jesus, with a resounding yes, says, I am the resurrection and the life. You'll never really die 
if you believe in me. You know, as we think, though, about, about Jesus and about the resurrection, about the events that are going on here, we also see a glimpse into the, the compassion and the heart of Jesus. In John 11, verse 35, as Jesus discusses with Mary and Martha about the loss of their brother, that, that Jesus wants to know where Lazarus is, and they say, come and see. And when Jesus saw the tomb and Lazarus being buried there, the Bible records these words. Jesus wept. You know, Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Mary. He loved Martha. He, he was a very compassionate. You know, people sometimes get the wrong image about Jesus. There's no doubt that Jesus had to deal with uh, religious hypocrites and had to speak plainly to them. No doubt Jesus had to deal with the sin problem, but sometimes I think people see Jesus as rather gruff and rough around the edges. But here you see the heart of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, his friend. Jesus wept. Why? Because He loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha. He didn't want to see them suffer. But at the same time, Jesus knew that all that would be done away with in the resurrection and the last day. And so we do see the heart of Jesus and His tears that are exhibited here. Now, as we think about John chapter 12, there's also some lessons that we will learn here, and one of those lessons relates to one of the closest followers of Jesus who would go on to betray Him. What do you know about Judas in the Bible? Well, I know he is one of the twelve. I know Jesus selected him, but what, what were Judas, what's going through Judas's mind, and what, what makes Judas tick, we might say? Well, look in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. At the anointing in Bethany, Bethany for Je preparing Jesus for His burial, the Bible says, But one of His disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray Him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now watch this. This He said, not that He cared for the poor, but because He was a thief and had the money box and He used to take what was put in it? What made Judas tick? What made him who he was? What was Judas's problem? Friend, I'll assure you, the devil knew that problem when he threw those 30 pieces of silver right before Judas's eyes. But Judas already had that problem. You know, he comes across as pretty good. Hey, th this shouldn't have been done. We could have taken this and sold it and given it to the poor. And yet, the Bible tells us he didn't care about the poor. He had the money box. He was in charge of that, and he was stealing out of it. Judas had a problem with greed. The things of this world and the stuff of this world, you know, those things are what are really what got to Judas and what made him who he was. Now, as we think about John 12 and the short amount of time remaining, there's several lessons that I want you to see that really jump out from this text. I want you to look at one of the great promises and, and really prophecies that is made about Jesus in John 12, verse 32 and 33. Look at these words. John 12, verse 32. Jesus speaking, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to Myself. This He said, signifying by what death He would die. If I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw everybody to myself. Friend, what's the drawing power of Christianity today? In, in your mind, in my mind, is it not that, that epitome of the greatest sacrifice that's ever been made? Jesus on that hill called Golgotha with His arms spread and His hands and feet nailed to a cross. Isn't that what draws men to Jesus? His love? His sacrifice? Who deserved to be on that cross? Me and you. The soul who sinned shall surely die, Ezekiel 18.4. And yet He bore in His own body our sins upon the tree. When Jesus is lifted up, that's the greatest example of God's love. And friend, that's what draws men to Christ and to the cross, what He did for each one of us. But as you think about this idea, and as we see Jesus as the great sacrifice, His great example of love, Friend, I also want you to see Jesus as the judge as well. Look in John chapter 12, verse number 48. I want you to see these words of Jesus. Jesus, in speaking about the Word of God, He says this in John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. 
when my life and yours is over, and remember, it's going to happen to all of us, when that final curtain falls on the final day when I stand before God and I give an account for the, done, I give an account for the things done in this body, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, what's going to be my judge? I'm not going to be judged by the Old Testament. That's not for Christians. That's not what we're living under today. I'm not, not going to be judged by popular opinion or books of men or what some religious leader today says. I'm not going to be judged by what my parents did or what they believed or w what was popular. What am I going to be judged by today? Notice again John 12, 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. Well, Lord, what is that? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Revelation 20 verses 12 through 15, And the dead, great and small, stood before God, and books were opened. And another book is opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to the things written therein. Friend, I will assure you that along with the book of life, as books are opened, one of those will be God's divine will. And we will stand before God and give an account for the things we've done in this life. And so, just to recap very briefly, in John chapter 10, we see Jesus as the good shepherd who gives the abundant life, who cares for his sheep, and who wants us to go to heaven, to be happy. John chapter 11, because we are now in Christ, one is a Christian, he has hope of the resurrection and the life through Jesus Christ. And friend, when I stand before God on the judgment day as a child of God, that is not a dark, dismal day. I can have hope and boldness in view of the judgment. But the real question remains, are you in Christ? Have you followed the good shepherd? Are you a part of God's sheep? If not, we encourage you to obey the gospel. Believe in Christ. John 8, verse 24. Repent of sin that may be in your life. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men. Romans 10, verse 10. And won't you do what Jesus said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. May God help each of us to follow Jesus, the true shepherd, to that eternal home in heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.